turn into your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. I want to begin by explaining the title of this morning's sermon. First, in the Apostle Paul's continuing presentation of justification by faith alone, apart from any good works of the law, he appeals to two Old Testament examples of Abraham and King David. So that's why their names are in the sermon title. And second, I have them shouting out or pointing to or being examples of what's called sola fide. And maybe you're not familiar with that term. It's a theological term. It's in Latin. Latin's what they call a dead language, is that no one speaks it anymore. Only scholars use it. And there's a lot of theological terms. And usually when I come across a Latin phrase, I have to look it up in the dictionary to see what it means. And it simply means faith alone. Sola fide, faith alone. And it's part of a greater collection of five solas, which describe the biblical view of our great salvation, which Christianity holds. And I've got a list of them for you if you're not familiar with them. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola scriptura, scripture alone. Solus Christus, Christ alone. And sola deo gloria, God's glory alone. And it just points to God being at work in this great salvation. So that brings us to Romans 4, verses 1 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. The reading of God's holy word. John Wesley, his personal testimony has always made a profound impact on all who have read about it. Here's a summary of how John Wesley came to Christ. He went to Oxford Seminary for five years in England and then became a minister of the Church of England where he served for about 10 years. Toward the end of his time, he became a missionary from England to the state of Georgia. (laughs) If you know me, I lived in Georgia for a number of years. And this was in approximately 1735. And all of his life, if you examined it from a certain aspect, he had been quite a failure in ministry. Though he was, as we would count men, very pious. He got up at four o'clock in the morning and prayed for two hours. He would then read his Bible for another hour before going to the jails, the prisons, the hospitals to minister to all manner of people. He would teach, pray for, and help others until late at night. He did this for years. In fact, the Methodist Church gets its name from the methodical life of piety that Wesley and his friends lived. They were called the Methodists 
and a whole denomination took their name from the example of his diligence. On the way back from America, as he went back home, feeling like a failure in ministry, there was a great storm at sea. The little ship upon which they were sailing was about to sink, and huge waves broke over the ship, and the wind roared through the sails. And Wesley feared that he was going to die that night, and he was terrified. He had no assurance of what would happen to him when he died. Despite all of his efforts to be good, death now for him was just a big black question mark. On one side of the ship, however, there was a group of men who were singing hymns. He asked them, how can you sing when this very night you're going to die? And they replied, if the ship goes down, we will go up to be with the Lord forever. Wesley went away shaking his head, thinking to himself, how can they know that? What have they done that I have not done? Then he added, I came to convert the heathen, but who shall convert me? You didn't know that about Wesley, did you? In the providence of God, the ship made it back to England, and Wesley went to London, and he found his way to Aldersgate Street to a very small chapel. And he heard a man reading a sermon which had been written two centuries before by Martin Luther. It was entitled, Luther's Preface to the Book of Romans. The sermon described what real faith was. Let's see if I can make it through it. It is trusting Christ Jesus alone for salvation and not our own good works. Wesley suddenly realized that he had been on the wrong road his whole life. That night, he wrote these words in his journal. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart, does anybody know the words? Strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation. And my assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That is the message of the book of Romans. But now, salvation has been manifested by faith apart from the works of the law. And what we get to do is chop up Paul's message and get this message over and over and over and over, where his readers just read through it one time, and they would see a large message with the same purpose. In Romans 4, 1 through 8, Paul as he's going through his message of justification by faith alone, introduces us to two great biblical figures of faith from the Old Testament scriptures, Abraham and David. Thought about singing Father Abraham again this morning with the kids. And Paul mentions them in order to show us the contrast of faith versus good works. And faith is the means to obtain the righteousness that everyone needs in order to obtain salvation. So let's, be, let's begin with Abraham. And he begins with a question, verse 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? See, Abraham was the father of the Jewish people. He was called by God to leave his homeland and move to a foreign country. God promised him more descendants than he could ever count. God said, look up at the sky. Can you count the stars? This is how numerous your descendants are going to be. He promised him a place 
for many of these descendants to live. Because Abraham didn't really quite know all to do about his descendants. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, God said, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we are products today of those words in Genesis 12, verse 3. I don't know whether Abraham understood that. But there was a promised land and a promised people that were spoken to Abraham that day. So Abraham left his homeland, journeyed to the promised land, began a family, circumcised Isaac on the eighth day, and in doing so, he took on this iconic almost legendary type status in Jewish history. And the Jewish people also viewed Abraham's obedience to God as legendary and basically perfect as well. I was reading one theologian named Douglas Moo and he records what some Jewish writers wrote about Abraham. Listen to how they viewed Abraham. And you'll see why Paul uses Abraham as an example here. One writer says, Abraham was perfect in all his deeds with the Lord and well-pleasing in righteousness all the days of his life. That's legendary status. Incorrect, but legendary. (laughs) They forgot that Abraham was an idolater with the rest of his family when he lived in the Ur of the Chaldees. They forget that Abraham put his wife in a harem down in Egypt in order to spare his own skin. They forget all those things about Abraham. Another writer wrote, Abraham did not sin against thee. I think their judgment was clouded a little bit. And one more, no one has been found like him in glory. I mean, Abraham was legendary. No wonder that so many Jews thought it was Abraham's good works and obedience that put him in right standing with God. And then Paul continues the argument in verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Now remember, this is one big continual argument, and he's just said in the end of Romans 3 that there's no boasting allowed. Remember that? For Abraham, if he was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So this is a good point to pause and consider what justification actually means. Being justified theologically, biblically, means being righteous before God. It's God declaring someone righteous in their sight. And there's a reason for their righteousness. It's either because of what you did or because of what you believe. It's being in good standing with God. It's being declared innocent. It's a legal term, meaning without blame. Abraham was not justified by his works. He had plenty of them, but they did not earn him any favor with God. In men's view, Abraham's work were, his works were unsurpassed. But as far as salvation is concerned, they gained him nothing. And neither do any works of any man or any woman anywhere in any time gain favor with God concerning salvation. Doing good things cannot get for us the righteousness that we desperately need. So ask yourself this question. 
when I come to God for salvation, am I bringing anything with me to justify myself? Am I relying on my good works for gaining favor from God? Is there anything that I have done or any character trait that I have exhibited that would cause people to recognize me as a role model? And am I bringing that status to God in hopes that he will justify me and declare me blameless in his sight? Am I depending on that in any way, even if it's just a grain of sand's worth for my justification? something to ponder. And then in verse 3, Paul writes, for what does the scripture say? And he quotes Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He just nuked the Jewish understanding of Abraham. Because your average Jew was banking on Abraham's good works. And he just quoted to them their own scripture of justification by faith alone. See, we must be directed by what the scripture says about this, not what people say or think and not what society or culture or religion or denomination say or think. Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6 to show that it was Abraham's faith that obtained the righteousness that he needed and not his good works and not his obedience to God's command. Not the fact that he left Ur of the Chaldees, not the fact that he went to Canaan, not the fact that he circumcised Isaac on the eighth day, not the fact that he brought Isaac as a sacrifice in obedience to God. None of that justified him. They were wonderful good works. But Abraham believed God. And God counted it as righteousness. He trusted God. He depended on God and his promises. And that's what justifies us as well before God. That's what puts us in right relationship with God. Romans 3.28 that we looked at on Palm Sunday. Paul writes, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And then Paul follows up this declaration of justification by faith alone, sola fide, with an illustration that I think everyone that's ever had a job and received a paycheck can relate to. And it's in verse 4. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. You know, I grew up with the green time clock hung right on our warehouse wall. You know the green one? That you take the time card out of the slot holder, the card holder, and you'd you'd line up the date and you'd hit the big black rectangular large button thing. And you'd come in in the morning, you'd put the time clock in and hit it, then you'd do it at the end, and then then on Friday, whoever was doing the payroll would get that and add up your hours, and then you were paid what you earned that week for the amount of hours you put in. And hopefully, you got paid for your overtime. (laughs) It kept time. And then you got paid according to the time that you clocked in and you clocked out every week. And you were paid accurately what you were due. It was the time on your time card that you were owed your check was made out for. I'm afraid that many churchgoers engage in what I call time clock Christianity in order to establish their relationship with God. 
They think their status with God is determined by what they do during the week. And then they submit that to God and go, God, see, I deserve relationship with you. Look what I've done. Look how I've prayed. Look how I've served. Concerning salvation, listen very closely. Do you want a paycheck for what you deserve? Or do you want a gift from the gracious hand of God? Does anyone here today want what they deserve from God? People often ask me, many of you have asked me, how are you doing today, Pastor Steve? And I often answer what I heard someone years ago say, much better than I deserve. I'll say that at the hardware store, the grocery store, or out and about sometimes, and some people will go, oh, no, 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 no. You deserve a lot. They don't understand. You see... We deserve the fires of hell because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's not popular. I deserve the wrath of God poured out on me for all eternity, and so do you. I have committed up to this very moment atrocities, war crimes against the ruler of heaven, against him, his throne, his castle, his holiness. I've broken his commands in thought and word and deed, indeed, and I have loved it. And I deserve the immediate sentence of death And yet I live, I breathe, I have a wonderful family, and I have an overall quality of life that I don't even begin to deserve. Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you want to live time clock Christianity? Or do you want the free gift of God? Then in Romans 4, 5, and to the one who does not work, now he doesn't mean just sitting around the couch. He's not talking about doing nothing. He's talking about does not work for his salvation, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. And this verse contains one of the most glorious and awesome descriptions of God you will find anywhere. Romans 4, 5, him who justifies the ungodly. And this goes against all reasoning ability that we have when we think about God. We go, how can God justify the ungodly? That is opposed to everything that I am to know about God. But God sent forth his only son and executed his own son on our behalf and accepted his son as the sacrifice for our sins. And whosoever would believe in that sacrifice would have their sins forgiven. Whoever believed and came sola fide, faith alone, God would justify the ungodly not because of works, not because of punching the time clock and expecting a paycheck, but freely and graciously by faith alone and Christ alone, by grace alone, because of what the scriptures say alone, and God gets all the glory. There's nothing that man has. That's the gospel. Are you working for your righteousness or are you believing When God looks and sees our works being offered for righteousness, he sees us falling short of his glory. When he sees our faith, he sees what we are trusting in, his son, Jesus Christ.
crucified and risen and sitting at the right hand of his throne, making intercession for us. He sees our attempts to be good, or he sees his own son, perfect and holy, with nail scars on his hands and feet. 2 Corinthians 5.21, a verse that you should memorize and quote in times of temptation to not believe the gospel. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paul now moves on to his second historical figure from Old Testament Israel, King David. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. And here Paul quotes what Terry read just a few minutes ago, Psalm 32 first two verses. David had every reason to despair. He was a great sinner. We know more about David's sin than we do about Abraham's. He was scheming. He was lustful. He was the king of Israel, and he had everything that you could imagine except the wife of one of his main warriors, Uriah the Hittite. Uriah's off fighting the enemies, and David's lusting after his wife, has an affair. She gets pregnant. He devises a scheme to have Uriah killed in battle, but it's murder. David's sin was exposed by the prophet. David recognized his sin, confessed his sin to the Lord, received forgiveness. He did much better than he deserved. Romans 4, 7, when David penned Psalm 32, he knew these words, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. That wasn't just some poetry he wrote while he was out in the garden. This was his life. What about us? Are we different from these guys? Should we dare to depend on our works when great figures like Abraham and David dared not to? There's only one way to God, and that is the way of Christ Jesus. We must have faith in him in order to be saved. Having believed like this, shouldn't it affect the way we live? See, there's a follow-up message to faith alone. Is that if you, if you have faith alone in Christ, God then begins a new work in you. He's already done a work so that you can believe, but then he starts a work which lasts your whole life. It's called sanctification. Having believed like this, shouldn't it affect the way we live now? If you say that if you believed, are you still living in fear and guilt and condemnation before God? Justification by faith alone in Christ brings us the benefits of the new covenant in Christ. It brings us righteousness. It brings us peace. It brings us joy in the Holy Spirit. It brings us a genuine promise of eternal life. But it's not always that easy, is it? Haven't we all said it sometime, and there's maybe some that are saying it right now, but my faith is weak, and the struggle is hard? Well, amen to that. I want to close with what Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, said. He said, it's not great faith, but true faith that saves.
the salvation lies not in the faith, but in the Christ in whom the faith trusts. Faith as a grain of mustard seed will bring salvation. It is not the measure of faith, but the sincerity of faith, which is the point to be considered.